opportunity for us really to come together and to make an impact and to really take precision health to the next level. I'm a football coach's daughter. Some of them have an acute injury that affects behavior long before CTE sets in. People don't like the word epidemic. I'm going to use the word. They're all so amazing that there's something new every time I talk to them, hear about them, because they're just doing such tremendous work and at such a, an incredible pace. Uh, so yeah, my, my brain feels like it is expanding tremendously so far just today. My son helped motorize a movement that got that selfie generation to dip their toes in the waters of philanthropy, and that's going to help us all. Ready, Bob? Well, I'm ready. You ready? One, two, three. <laughs> there isn't anyone in this room that doesn't love somebody right now who has either lost a battle with unmet medical need or is currently struggling with one. It does not discriminate. It does not discriminate. It affects all of us. Powering Precision Health 2018, the reason why I think you should, you should attend is if in fact you see an opportunity to empower yourself into your own health destiny. We have such a journey of opportunity with these biomarkers and the innovation that these biomarkers are bringing to medicine. And if you think you can have a role in the movement, and, the, and that role could be one of advocacy, it could be one of being a scientist, it could be one of being an innovator, it could be one of being an investor. Just about in every walk of life, there's a community that is coming together to really talk in layman's terms about the most advanced scientific opportunities in our lifetime. We have a chance to make our mark in this world through Powering Precision Health. So, good morning everyone in this beautiful setting. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the Powering Precision Health Summit. I'm Professor Charlotte Teunissen from Amsterdam UMC, location VUMC, and I would like to warm you, uh, warmly welcome you to Amsterdam. So that's our uh, home base. We are also honored to host the first ever PPH Summit in Europe. It is great to see so many of you here from all over Europe, as we know how busy everyone is, especially at this time of the year. While we work, my work, uh, which you will see in a minute, uh, focuses on neurology. We are all here today because we believe in the power of research and the promise of precision healthcare to improve the lives of patients everywhere. This year's PPH Summit is unique, not just because it's in Europe for its first time, but also because PPH has now become an independent, non-profit uh, organization, making it an even more credible platform to impact healthcare. All of us here today can be part of this movement, which today focuses on better diagnosis and treatment, but which aspire to move medicine from that paradigm to a new one of prevention and early detection. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Kevin Rusowski, founder and chairman of Powering Precision Health, who will now provide a few opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charlotte. So good morning. It's absolutely an honor. And Charlotte, thank you so much for that introduction. This is um, our first Pyrene Precision Health here in Europe. And it took a while for us to spin out Pyrene Precision Health into a nonprofit. And we didn't even believe we were going to have a, a Pyrene Precision Health in 2018 based on a lot of the legal matters that we've gone through. We were successful a little about a month ago, so this actually has been assembled in about the last month. So I must say we're just totally honored to be here, right here in the Netherlands, to 
kick off the first European one. I, was lear I learned last night on the canal that Netherlands is really Germany without rules. <laughs> and I mentioned it to a German that was standing there, and they said, actually, the Netherlands is really northern Germany. So, you know. <laughs> but this is um, really incredible to be in this Lutheran church. I think it was built in the 1600s. And so if nothing else today, we're going to get some divine inspiration around everything that we're trying to achieve here with Precision Health. The way we're gonna walk through today, I'd like to welcome you. I'm gonna do about a 45 minute discussion around what we're attempting to do with Precision Health. And then we're gonna go from there into, right into a panel of some of the most amazing thought leaders in the world around neuro health. So to get started, the vision as we've been discussing is how do we get people healthy and try to go after some of the profitability in the world that might be getting in the way of our own health. And there's a lot of established a capability in the world to basically get in the way of our own health. And this slide actually is an illustration of just how bad it's gotten in the United States as it relates to life expectancy versus how much it costs per person for health care. United States is living shorter length of time than most of the world, and we're spending five to 10 times more per person than the rest of the world. So a lot of our movement started in the United States because we're like, what the heck is going on that's making the United States so unhealthy and actually so expensive to live for healthcare? So our overall goal is how do we get back into the same landscape as many of the rest of the world relative to healthcare expenditures and life expectancy. We also have watched with a lot of interest the digital revolution that's been occurring for about the last 10 years around the world. It really started with the iPhone just really taking off. And then over the last, I would say, five years, you can see that there's a lot of companies that are becoming billion dollar companies overnight. Literally, companies like Facebook and Uber as well as you know, Google and the different types of disruption, it's all occurring primarily in software. And this whole area of digital revolution, you can see the speed in which the billion dollar club has accumulated in really the last three or four years because of the speed of how digital is revolutionizing almost every industry in the world, but it really hasn't done that much yet in healthcare, which is probably the area that we are all most interested in. So with that advancing, we actually believe that there's opportunities at the corner of digital and healthcare to really begin to revolutionize. And a lot of what this movement is about that we're talking is about digital biomarkers, the ability to actually look inside the body and see things at levels of sensitivity that no one has ever been able to see before. And that's opening up whole new fields of exploration in the body. The movement itself has got a lot of challenges. This is primarily a, a payer industry, meaning that normally the consumer themselves is not paying for their own health care. So you have someone in the middle that creates a whole different dynamic in healthcare around the world than traditional consumer businesses where the digital revolution has been very rapid to take over. We also know that there's a lot of medical unmet needs that we have to f find a way to pay for. So in the United States, we've got Medicare. There's a lot of bureaucracy around the reimbursement systems. We also have a very archaic medical records. And so even what you're born with, by the time you're 10 years old, a lot of that is lost. And so there's just so much opportunity to really revolutionize the way we live our lives and those healthy opportunities that lie ahead of us. Even if you're treating disease today, it might cost you as much as you can see on this, a billion dollars to bring a drug to market. And many of those drugs that we bring to market have incredibly difficult side effects. And sometimes those drugs could be as dangerous as some of the benefits that they bring to the industry. So we, have, we know we're challenged as well with the whole aspect of getting things approved. And we also know that there's a lot of egos in the boardrooms of many of the companies that we work for, and sometimes those egos get in the way of real disruption and real progress. And we've watched with a lot of amazement how hard it's been to transform healthcare over the last 20 years. And there is an opportunity to really go after this. But we also know there's folks 
that have built companies like Theranos, and this is what we call the Elizabeth Holmes effect, where when we started PPH four years ago, it was really about getting the science first, to get third-party peer-reviewed publications from all of the scientific community to validate that the technologies could truly affect health and to not create any kind of fraud or any kind of manipulation in the overall approach. And this is still to this day is a key goal for Pyrene Precision Health is to start with the science and make sure that the science is supporting and validating the path that we're going in. This situation at Theranos could have actually stopped a lot of investors from investing in life sciences if we didn't find a way to bring credibility back into the system. So I'm really encouraged that over the last 12 months there's been an infusion of a lot of capital from many of the investors. I spent all day in London on Monday, I see Mark is in the audience, and we had some of the wealthiest people in Europe sitting through meetings talking about precision health. And the, and the really important part of, I think, a lot of the wealth that is in the world is, is that no one is alleviated from the health concerns of the world. And so many of these very wealthy people might end up with Parkinson's, they might end up with Alzheimer's, they might end up with cancer, and that further causes them to really want to get involved in the movement. And so. We're really proud to say that there's a lot of opportunity for health to get better and there's a lot of very wealthy people around the world that are now getting very much involved in funding many of the efforts that are going on around the world. Today we're going to have keynote um, presentations and panel discussions from some of the top thought leaders in the world as you can see them assembled here. We also, I see Sandy up here as a Swedish hockey player. I'm really proud that Sandy is here at our PPH that we had back in, in um, United States last year, you may have noticed we had like the, the whole AOS movement with Nancy Frades and Pete Frades with the Ice Bucket Challenge. He's been on a ventilator for four years. Several markers were discovered post-PPH around AOS. Some of the neurologists that were at that meeting left very inspired and did a lot of great work towards that. We had a lot of NFL Super Bowl winning football players too that are going through a lot of trauma, a lot of soldiers that post-traumatic stress disorder, a lot of challenges that we brought to bear with advocacy. Today, Sandy is our advocate, so really thank you for coming and, and helping us make sure we bring this um, real. We, we also have speakers across all of these different institutions that are moving the world in, in healthcare, which is awesome to see. Today, we've got 10% of our audience in oncology, 55% is in neurology, and cardiac is 22%. And I'm not sure what happened to the other 15%, but you're out there somewhere. Um, advocates, providers in academia, therapies, and investors, this is the way today's percentages stack up. We only have about 5% investors here today, which at the PPH we had in the United States, it was probably more like 20%. And we did do a lot of work in London prior to coming here, so that's where we created a lot of that um, approach. But we do have a lot of uh, folks here that are building therapies for treatments. And we also have a lot of sponsorship. I'm really proud that this is all funded by the sponsors that are shown on this slide. And even JP Morgan, one of the largest banks in the world, is now getting much behind this. Jamie Diamond, who actually took us public a year ago, who's the chairman CEO of JP Morgan, he personally is very involved in trying to help make sure we advance health, and he is working with Warren Buffett and several others right now to further fund and bring a lot of the precision health opportunity into digitize. So we're real excited that this group um, is, is sponsoring today. And from the Quanterix team, they may not all be in the room, but there's um, a lot of folks that have come here to try to interact, and there's a lot of learning. As the top sponsor for PPH, this is how we figure out what to invest in next. So we learn so much from these discussions and these presentations to make sure that we're, make, we're moving our investments consistent with where you need them to be moved. So let me talk a little bit about disease triggers that I think is really um, a key point that we'd like to bring home, and that is that for the first time, life expectancy has gone down in the United States the last two years. The opioid crisis itself is having a profound effect. There's actually 22 suicides by veterans alone every day. We're having six suicides a day. Um, uh, uh, we have six suicides an hour right now in the United States to give you a sense of how bad mental health has become in the United States and around the world. So the whole area of mental health, what is it that's triggering us? There's disease 
that gets created from what we're born with, but then we think that 60 to 80% of disease is these environmental triggers, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about this, but we also are watching this population explosion that started in 1960, and we're now up to seven billion people in the world, and there's some estimates that that could double in the next 30 years, and that's putting so much stress on Earth that Earth, in a way, might be fighting back, and basically some of the diseases that are being created could be Earth's attempt to eradicate humans from annihilating Earth. So we're watching very carefully around environmental impacts. But when you look at the future, there's a lot of projections that cancers are going to continue to increase 60%. Diabetes will double to a billion people with diabetes. Neuro will be 66% increase, trillions of dollars going into neuro health. 25% of the United States will suffer some kind of mental illness throughout their life now. That's almost double where it was just 30 years ago. So there's something going on environmentally. And even asthma is becoming maybe one of the larger um, issues for the future as pollution continues to uh, run rampant across the globe. Interestingly, the sugar consumption in the United States is like 10 times the rest of the world. So you wonder now if we're starting to see some of the linkages of what might be going on. France and Japan are significantly below. And by the way, they're living a lot longer for a lot less money per instant per person. Energy consumption, interestingly, too, is the opposite. There's a reverse correlation. The more energy per person that a country consumes, the, lo the shorter their lifespan. I don't know if it's all the bicycles I see here in Holland that we need to get more of those in the United States, maybe a little bit more exercise, but that reverse correlation is incredible. And then look at the overweight. We have a major issue in overweight and obesity. So could this be an environmental factor that could have a lot of the issues that we have in the United States. And just looking at where we were in 1994, relative to the amount of obesity, the darker the color, the more the obesity, and the amount of diabetes. And just this period of time, 20 years, you can see that we've got just a epidemic level of diabetes and, and met metabolic meta, um, issues throughout um, United States, and so there's a real linkage. And we also know around the world, many countries have eradicated sugars, and they've gone proactively with their health councils to actually remove them. So someday I think we're going to be learning as well. And we're seeing all these linkages. There's study after study to obesity towards the cancers. 40% are linked to being overweight. Um, we also know that lifestyle is more important than you may think. It takes, in America, 41% has to have a near-death experience before they're gonna change their diet. That's how hard these addictions have become. And I should also point out that this whole concept of the food addiction is somewhat scientific. We've, I've actually been in the food industry and I actually watched them look for the bliss point, they call it. They would do scans, brain scans, looking for dopamine um, and looking for different extractions of enzymes at the moment when the salt, sugar, and fat content were at the right ratio, they could see those excretions. And that was the food industry, the scientists basically saying, okay, now we can make a, something that they can only, they can't eat just one. That's by design. That's what's gone on in America and around the world in certain cases. And so it's not, un, it's not surprising that we've got such a food epidemic. We also got these subsidies that go into sugar cane and corn that make these these particular products almost free in the United States, and that makes um, the consumption of the sugar cane and the corn that goes in the corn syrup goes into chickens, cows, and salmon. So we actually are completely starting to move this omega-6, omega-3 syndrome into the food supply, and we're also using a lot of antibiotics, we're using a lot of pesticides, and we're pumping growth hormones into the cattle and into the chickens at a pace that you just cannot believe. We're milking cows three times a day. They weren't meant to be milked three times a day. So it's not surprising that these growth hormones have been linked to a lot of the breast cancers that are running at an epidemic in the United States as well. So we know there's a lot of things going on with profitability of the food industry that could be getting in the way of health. And so this omega-6 overload is creating, we know, a lot of overstimulation and inflammation that's the basis of many of the diseases that we're trying to, con to go after. Concussions. Could concussions be an environmental factor that are triggering disease? Well, we now have a lot of evidence that there's a lot of linkage of concussions to a lot of issues. And now 60 Minutes themselves are beginning to showcase this. Whether you're a veteran with post-traumatic stress disorder, whether you play sports, even the rugby, uh, chairman now, we're doing work with him um, here in Europe. Um, there's a lot of evidence that concussions can be a, a key trigger. 
So when we move to the next phase is how do you start to look at these different factors and start to understand the implication of them? This slide basically tries to say that today we see sick care being the way medicine is practiced. It's primarily episodic symptoms that trigger us to come to see what's going on with ourselves. Challenge is, is that by the time you see symptoms, it's very expensive typically to correct the person. And it's also, by the time you see symptoms, it's pretty late stage in many of the diseases. So the concept of healthcare is how can we get much earlier understanding what's going on in our bloodstreams or in non-invasive samples long before we have symptoms and long before the cascade of pathology prevents it from being an economic return. So many countries have actually just removed sugar as being a way to kind of get at much better lifestyles that prevent many diseases. But someday we think that seeing disease earlier is another way that you can prevent disease. And so one, this axis um, on the, the y-axis is just basically trying to show the invasiveness of testing. And obviously a biopsy or a lumbar puncture is pretty invasive. And in some countries, and I know Henrik at our last meeting said the lumbar puncture is okay in Sweden, but we know that Novartis had 40% of the, of the cohorts leave a trial for Alzheimer's because it required a lumbar puncture. Some of us around the world aren't as tough as the Swedish and being able to handle a lumbar puncture, so it's considered very invasive. So when you go down in the invasivity, even imaging has a lot of radiation and there's a lot of exposure to radiation that suggests a lot of issues. But when you further go down, if you can get to blood testing, liquid biopsies and or saliva or urine testing, now you're talking about very low invasive testing. And so cancer is up in that top right corner in disease detection. It typically, you don't get pancreatic cancer symptoms sometimes until three months before you die. Lung cancers, many times you don't get symptoms until it's very late and many times it's metastatic. And so we look at cancer and neuro both being way up in the upper right and we look at infectious disease and cardio as actually having some advancing over the last, I'd say, 25 years to being able to see disease a little bit earlier. But we think that down in the bottom left corner is if you can get early detection with very low invasiveness, you can transform healthcare. And that's a lot of the focus we think of digital biomarkers is to try to move it down. This is just an example of imaging. 50% um, false positive in today's mammogram. There's a lot of work going on to have a blood test to replace the mammogram as an example. But these are very invasive tests because of the radiation that goes through the body when you have it. And if you end up with a false positive, you might go through four or five more mammograms as you go through resections and three weeks of anxiety. So this is a very challenging test that actually has some negative effects to it. We also look at the CAT scan that's being used for traumatic brain injury. Just in the United States alone, there's 20 million CAT scans annually. And the amount of radiation in a, in a CAT scan to the head is three to 400 times the radiation of a chest X-ray. We actually now know through studies, many of studies, that there's over 20,000 brain cancers, and it's somewhat of an epidemic. You probably heard about John McCain and Joe Biden's son dying of brain cancer, Ted Kennedy. There's a lot of brain cancer going on throughout the United States. My son-in-law is a dentist, and every time I go to the dentist, they like to kind of take a picture of your face and your head, and I'm like, I don't want any more of that. I want to stop the brain cancer movement if I could. But point being is, is that 29,000 brain cancers now per year in the United States are linked to the overusage of CAT scans. And by the way, when they use a CAT scan on a traumatic brain injury, it looks like the data suggests that only 8% of the time it's providing any benefit to the neurologist. So I'm happy today we have Jackson Streeter who ran Banyan Diagnostics for four years. He joined Quanterix about three weeks ago. That was the first two biomarkers that the FDA approved for brain health, basically to rule out the need for the CAT scan. So we're real excited that we're gonna be trying to deploy all of those kinds of technologies with greater sensitivity as we move forward. This is um, a slide that basically says that for the last 25 years, the investor community has dove onto DNA. They just love DNA, they love Illumina. Everywhere you turn, it's next generation sequence this, next generation sequence that. There's predisposition, even 23andMe is teaching people about how 
you know, all you really have to do is look at your parents and some of your heredity, but they're telling you that, hey, you got, you know, a good chance of getting diabetes based on your parents having it. Well, there's a lot of predisposition that comes with DNA, and I love the identical twin studies where they're born with the exact same DNA, and one grows up to get cancer, the other grows up to get Alzheimer's. Well, what is it that's different? Well, it's the way they live their lives. It's those environmental triggers. And we think the protein has got the best chance of seeing those modifications to that DNA to RNA landscape. So we think the protein is more relevant in the body. We also think it's more abundant. We have evidence that it's a thousand times more abundant than a single copy. We've been able to make DNA a little bit more sensitive with amplification, but we also know that there's a lot of bias, AT bias. There's a lot of challenge with what you amplify not being what you started with. So we think the protein is a great place to start. There's a lot of work still in DNA and RNA that can be done, and we're excited about that, particularly if you can get there without using PCR. And we know you can with sensitivity, but these lifestyle choices, we think, are a key area for future. So when we look at this concept of when do you get detected with the disease, when you're asymptomatic, you are sick, and, and the challenge is, is that today you don't normally see those diseases. And so we decided that cancer and neuro are probably the two biggest areas that you're seeing things very late and it's costing a lot of money with invasiveness. And so we think those are the two first areas where we should try to move to the bottom left. And today we do have um, a lot of analysis going into um, sick care. There's 205 proteins today that are approved, Roche, and Abbott, um, Siemens, these are big protein houses where there's 205 proteins that are FDA approved, IVD type proteins that are measured, but they're measured at abundant levels. Typically, once you get sick, they go up and they can then see those levels and they tell you that you're sick. The concept here is, is to try to go further down into the um, lower concentrations of proteins to help us get lower invasiveness on the left-hand axis, the y-axis, or see disease earlier on the x-axis. We think this is game-changing. This is where a lot of the focus of precision health is going. And when you look at oncology, you know, there's $350 billion of expense today worldwide. There's 9 million people dying. We talked about that going up significantly over the next 30 years. And inflammation is at the base of it. And today, imaging is primarily used. They'll find a tumor through imaging, and that will be sometimes the first step after symptoms of diagnosing cancer. And by the time there's a tumor, there's a chance that this has already gone through the body in a pretty complete way. So um, we're pretty focused on ways of seeing cancers in liquid biopsies. This next one is talking about neurology. There's 270 billion um, today of cost. And there's 18 million um, deaths per year of um, neurology related diseases. And you can see the, the different proteins in the cerebral spinal fluid. And the concept here is, is that what cuts across, into, across the blood-brain barrier into the, the six quarts of blood that traverse the 60,000 miles of vascular structure that we have in our body, a small concentration. On, on average, it seems like it's 1 50th to 1 100th the concentration that you might have in the cerebral spinal fluid. So being able to see that is like a big deal. And that's a lot of the recent advances that are being made in a lot of the biomarkers is being able to see it in blood. Now, it's interesting when you apply this really great sensitive detection technology in the cerebral spinal fluid, many of the scientists in this room are now seeing protein translational modifications that are like a sublet below in the cerebral spinal fluid. And they're asking us, how can we see those over in the blood? So we know we need to go another 100x in sensitivity to kind of keep getting into the next field of science where those subtypes are going to be very, very important. And everywhere we look now, we're seeing scientists coming up and seeing things in the cerebral spinal fluid that they want to be able to see in blood and they can't yet. So we're going to keep pursuing um, across those, those frontiers. And then cardiology and other primarily inflammation. You can see the expense, but key here is the number of biomarkers that were used in our last presentation that we had in the United States. This is the number of publications and the number of biomarkers that we think have been validated for these different categories of disease. And up at the top is what Quantarix, at least at this point, has been able to showcase in the number of third-party peer-reviewed publications and a number of biomarkers that are being run using that extraordinarily high-sensitivity technology. 
So this slide is just a slide that um, I wanted to illustrate that if, when you look at Quanterix, they have advanced the Luminex bead technology into this exquisite sensitivity using the HD1 and the SRX. And we're launching, um, I believe, first half of 2019, what we call the SPX, which is somewhat like the MSD technology. It's using planar, but it's getting to a 10 to 100 fold more sensitivity with multiplexing. So that is a, another key advance that is being attempted. But the third generation is something that we are working hard on. David Duffy and Don Mattoon are not at this meeting. They're back there working on 100X. <laughs> How do we go the next level for the next generation of testing, particularly for the post-translational modifications that we know is the next field. So this is the SPX, um, and the, today you can see the level of sensitivity that's out there, but with the SPX, we're hoping to come up with at least 10x to 100x greater sensitivity in a multiplex, 10plex, looking at some of the most important cytokines for immunotherapies, and that's really gonna be the focus of the SPX, is going after the immunotherapies with a 10-plex that we really feel is going to help us understand cytokine storms, understand upregulation and downregulation. I did want to now move towards treatments, which is the first major phase of precision health. It's how do we make the drugs that people consume much more effective with much lower toxicity? And you can see here the toxicity is a pretty big problem. In fact, I think there's some data that says it's the fourth leading cause of death in the United States are the side effects to drugs. Chemotherapy itself is one of the most lethal drugs. But also you can see that cancer drugs on, on average only work about 25% of the time. So they're, not, they're low efficacious with a lot of toxicity. There's evidence that the biomarker community can bring a significant improvement in the probability that a drug can be approved if you have biomarkers. This was data coming from the biopharmaceutical industry that if you have a phase one approval, the probability of getting a phase three approval is only 8%. If you use biomarkers, it's 25%. And so we're deploying a lot of focus in the areas you see here in, in red that are the areas that we think we can have the biggest impact in increasing the probability. And cancer is going from 5.1%, hopefully to more like 25%. And on the right-hand side, you can see that there's a significant uptake of this technology in pharma biotech now to get these drugs approved, phase one, two, three trials. The FDA has got even something called adaptive trials now that if you run with biomarkers and you don't get approval initially, you can go back in and look and use biomarkers to stratify those patient populations. We actually have a, an FDA commissioner that had cancer. His name is Scott Gottlieb. We're hoping he'll be at the next PPH in the United States. He's personally very focused on using biomarkers to see disease earlier so that you can get the dosing down on many of the drugs that are not as toxic to create the cure or, the, or at least the, the treatment of that disease. So seeing disease earlier with biomarkers allows, we think, improvements not just in efficacious, you know, the effectiveness, but also the toxicity. This slide just basically um, describes neurodegeneration and just how big of a market this is beginning to evolve. And so a lot of investors are starting to say, it used to be you only invested in things that killed people. And cancer kills people, and so cancer is like three times the size of neurology. But now there's a beginning movement towards funding things that increase the productive and the quality of life. So neurology, we think, is going to be the next major frontier of investment, and we're doing everything we can to try to help that based on the, this, the, the number of issues that we know the world is suffering from in the area of neurology and the ways in which we think testing can change that. And so if, for the investment community, we think there's $5 billion of biomarker-type opportunities over the next 15 years in the area of neurology that we're really starting to expand in based on the science that's going on right here in this room, and we're gonna be hearing from some of the top leaders of this uh, landscape in, a, in, in about 10 minutes. I did wanna show this because back 10 years ago, there were all these drugs for Alzheimer's on the left-hand side, but if you look in 2018, how few drugs there are going through trials. It's scary that there's so few drugs now going into Alzheimer's versus where we were 10 years ago. I actually think, though, from what I've witnessed,
the biomarker movement is starting to change their belief systems of ways to get more objectivity in getting a drug approved, where it's been very subjective in the way a lot of those trials are run, trying to look at whether dementia can be reversed. And if it takes 10 years, which many of the scientists we work with feel the pathology of Alzheimer's starts maybe with the immune system as a match, and then it goes to a brush fire, ultimately to a raging forest fire before dementia hits. And so if you can get it when it's a match, it's gonna be a lot easier to blow it out with a drug versus waiting to reverse dementia. And so the FDA has always said, you gotta reverse the symptoms to get the drug approved. They're now saying, if you have a biomarker that you can show is clinically relevant and you can stop the progression of that biomarker, we're gonna approve the drug long before symptoms. And then if that doesn't work in the end, based on phase four data, we're gonna pull that drug five years later from the market. That's a major transformative guidance that the FDA has done in the last six months to change the whole investment scenario, we think, for Alzheimer um, interest for, for many of our customers. And here is um, the FDA not only um, looking for disease earlier, to put it out earlier as a match, but they're expediting reviews of any debilitating condition. And that's part of why you know, we saw Banyan getting their approval in five months for those two biomarkers for, you know, they mentioned earlier, to eliminate CAT scans. That was, that was a high priority, fast track, because it's a national priority, the concussion issue that we have in the United States. And so, again, we've got some very forward-looking thinkers right now in the FDA, and it's, we've got to really move quick before the, he's no longer the commissioner, because you never know what happens next. So I'm doing everything I can to help make sure we get drugs moving, particularly in those areas where we really need help. And the other thing that they've done is that they're allowing reimbursement to um, get created quicker. So if you use FDA kind of guidelines and you have a central laboratory like a specialty lab that might be a laboratory developed test in LDT, companies like Exact Sciences for Coligard and Foundation Medicine for some of the newer cancer mutational work, they're getting what, what's called dual path. They're getting Medicare reimbursement the same time they get their LDT approval. So that's changing the economics in a way that a lot of investors are very excited and are now diving into this landscape. This is really good for the biomarker movement in my mind. This was a, um, some presentations that were at this year's AAIC, and we had most of these people assembled. I think, Henrik, you gave a presentation at our KOL dinner that we had in Chicago, and there's a lot of evidence of the biomarker movement um, going on with Samoa, and you can see the presentations and the publications in the top right corner. I didn't attend Extram, but um, I'm told that Ectrums this year was just off the charts, that you just, everywhere you look, people were talking about NFL, neurofilament light, trying to understand neuronal damage at a whole new level in serum, and look at the number of presentations and the number of companies. Many of you are here today, which is exciting. Um, this is just a, um, a slide that shows the number of publications in neurology that started back when we won the Head Health Challenge um, with the NFL, who seemed to be really concerned about concussions back then. The NFL then lost a billion dollar lawsuit to many of the football players and then they kind of backed off a little bit. We're not sure exactly how concerned they really are for concussions, um, but we're doing everything we can because right now the NIH is running a 21 different NCAA Division I football teams in the United States is running a major trial on Samoa for concussions. And so even if the NFL is not interested, I can tell you the NCAA Division I is very interested. And those results will be out, we think, within the next month or two. Um, Jessica Gill is doing that work. She was actually going to try to be at this meeting, but uh, we couldn't Skype her in, so we decided we'll have her to, at the next meeting. But um, again, NFL started, I think, with some of the panelists, Henrik and others. You're going to see um, Jens. Uh, there's this, this whole area is just exploding with interest. Um, you can see the publications continuing to increase. And then when you hone in on multiple sclerosis, it seems like this is an area that there's just tremendous interest from many of our customers that we see that have new MS drugs kind of hit the market. Um, but beyond just new drugs hitting the market, there's opportunities with today's drugs because today there's a lot of drugs for MS and the real question is, are they working? And we're using imaging and MRIs. Sometimes it may take as long as two years to two and a half years to know whether or not that MS has had a certain 
course of impact on the brain through brain atrophy. We're going to learn more about this, but if you can figure things out much quicker and the cycle time of getting to the right drug, you can maybe keep MS patients out of wheelchairs. And this is key for us is how do you increase the cycle time? We call it on therapy diagnostics. Once you get the treatment, how quickly can you use biomarkers to understand whether that treatment is having a desired effect? We know in immunotherapies we're going to have a major role. We think the same is true with NFL potentially and in, in, in NMS. And today you can see on the right hand side that there are 22 billion dollars, 15 different MS drugs today that are trying to be deployed and it takes forever for many of the neurologists to figure out whether those drugs are having a desired effect. And there are 62 trials, I'm actually I think there's 63 now, 10 of them have the NFL, neurofilament light serum, being utilized in those trials. So I would think there should be 63 trials using NFL and so until that occurs, I think there's a lot of opportunity to improve the way we get MS drugs to market. Uh, Parkinson's, you're going to be hearing from Dennis. I mean, this is a whole other area, and there's a lot of evidence that even some immune system indications could be starting there. And many of our biomarkers are linked to the immune system as well as to neurology. And so to the extent you start to look at multiplex, looking at immune system as well as neuromarkers, we think that there's just tremendous opportunity. Um, there's also the NFL breakthrough for the Huntington's disease, maybe uh, being the next major marker to be utilized in that disease. Um, we mentioned Alzheimer's. There's a lot of um, publications now coming for Alzheimer's. We just had one from um, one of our scientific founders, David Walt, has done a lot of work um, in neuro-derived extracellular vesicles, um, biomarker discovery and neurodegeneration. He just had a paper come out last week Again, further evidencing um, new investment from Zuckerberg from Facebook, putting a lot of investment right into Parkinson's and in these, some of these ailments, which is good to see some of the wealthier um, folks really starting to dive in on some of the opportunity. Today, there's all these different publications against all these different neuro diseases using the biomarkers on the right-hand side. Some of the folks here today, I see uh, Cohen, um, ADX is here, Uman's here, Nicholas. Uh, Banyan we mentioned um, earlier, but all these markers now, uh, we're seeing them at exquisite levels of sensitivity. And on the left-hand side shows a number of NFL publications that you can see over the last three years, MS has really ramped up, but you can see that we're seeing publications in these other categories too ramping up. And over on the right-hand side, you can see how much bigger those diseases are beyond MS. So we really do believe that NFL is going to have a lot of uh, versatility moving forward. So we've actually built our own CLIA lab to start running trials. We're running phase one, two, and three trials now for pharma right inside Quanteryx. This is a big area of investment because we've had so many customers <coughs> pushing us towards being able to do this that we felt this was an important investment for us. Moving just quickly to cancer and suppression inflammation surveillance, um, the whole immunotherapy landscape, all these biomarkers now are ones that we have in the menu to kind of go after the cancers. And on the right hand bottom, you can see all the CROs that are utilizing, these are contract research houses that are running trials, phase one, two, three trials for our customers across all of these biomarkers, primarily in immunotherapy and autoimmune diseases. Um, again, it's a big area of, of, of longer-term opportunity. So this, care, this term on therapy, diagnostics, and oncology, how quickly can we see whether or not the immune system is upregulating appropriately with a drug or VEGF? We know that there's a lot of drugs today that are going after VEGF, and sometimes they get 50% response rates. We have evidence that by looking at these biomarkers, we can predict which patients are going to benefit versus which ones won't. Now that might reduce the size of the pharma market, but it will allow the drug to be hopefully 100% effective. We think that that's very important and that's why we ourselves have gone to the FDA teaching them about the tools of digital biomarkers and the role that they can play to help get drugs more efficacious with lower dose. Cytokines, modulated therapies, and the whole predictive nature of biomarkers we think is all areas of opportunity. The whole cytokine storm where patients not only sometimes don't benefit from the drug, many of these immunotherapies can be $200,000 of expense for one therapy, 
and it could be six months, which could be 10 therapies before they can get an image to determine whether that therapy is having a desired effect. By that time, you could have not only a bad response, but you could have a cytokine storm. So this is a cliff. This is, does the drug work is on one side, but if it doesn't work, are you actually putting the patient at significant risk by continuing to give them that immunotherapy? So seeing these things much earlier, we think is gonna be important. So, you know, going back to um, the overall priority of trying to, to help advance, you know, the whole area of precision health, you know, my view and our, our quest and our plea is that someday when we have our annual physicals, we'll have a dashboard that looks like this, that we'll be looking at our annual physicals and know all those biomarkers will be being run across cardiology, across cancers, across neurology, across inflammation. If you have a child playing soccer and you're worried about whether them doing the header is having a detrimental effect on the long-term mental health of that poor kid, can we watch these neuromarkers in the annual physicals? We think that that's coming someday. We actually think someday there might be a wristwatch where we can watch our biomarkers. So we are very focused on investing aggressively as we can. Exciting investors, exciting scientific thought leaders to the possibilities of what this can do for the world. So this is um, the longer term opportunity and, and quest. And the good news is over the, you know, the last two years, you could see the number of companies that have adopted this. And in the last 12 months, we see across the board adoption of these kinds of approaches to make treatments and therapies better. So this is an encouraging um, advance for us. So to, to close this presentation out, I'd like to just say, um, we're trying to catalyze disruption with the debate and the collaboration. This meeting is nothing without the people that are gonna be sitting up on the stage, the people that are presenting, all of you in the audience. This is really all about how do we collaborate and learn from each other. I, for instance, I think someone mentioned it on the boat. I get the name drop Henrik. I get the name drop Jens. This is like just being able to name drop their names feels like such an honor. And the fact is that all of us are in these meetings together. The Robertos, the, the, the Flores. We got all this scientific capability where we can interact during breaks tonight. Everywhere you can interact with people, please exchange cards. It's all about us coming together and learning from each other because none of us have the answer. That's the key here. Even some investors sometimes have the money that we might need. So everywhere you look, we need others to make this movement successful. So please reach out, do everything you can to help us be better at what we're trying to become. The agenda you all have, um, I'm just completing the first step which was introduce the concepts of what we're trying to do with Precision Health and to lay the foundation for the rest of today. But <clears throat> these are some of the big questions that I'd love to see people uh, be addressing today. How can we advance this Precision Health concept? What do you guys see as the barriers that are stopping you from your scientific exploration or from getting approvals or for getting reimbursement? Each of you are in different parts of the value chain. How can we um, get digital biomarkers to impact healthcare? Is today's profitability of other industries like the food industry or the sports industry or the war industry, are these getting in the way of our health? And can we take down that profitability? Is imaging potentially creating problems with our health versus helping? Clearly imaging is gonna be always around and is gonna be very much important and effective, but do we overuse it? Can we come up with complementary blood markers to get a much better answer? And can we do it in our lifetime? Can we accelerate this so that we all can benefit, our children can benefit from this? Can we get moving on this quickly? When and how will biomarker detection improve patient outcomes and survival? Will it be in our lifetime? It's been so frustrating for me to listen to some of the top thought leaders break, having breakthroughs, but then saying, when is it that we can get this adopted and in the medical practice? We have to come up with new ways to disrupt this into action quickly, in our views, for this to have the benefit in our lifetimes. How can we accelerate it? Can we overcome genetic predisposition um, with the way we live our lives is what that was intended to be? And will the revolution happen and how can we accelerate it? So. Without any further ado, if you um, will so um, allow me, I'm going to introduce and bring up to the stage these thought leaders so we can start and keep the discussion going. So please come to the stage. Thank you very much.